Okay, so now we should be recording. All right, aloha everyone at home. We are now starting the autonomic nervous system section of the exam one review. And if you're just now following from home, I have compiled a study guide. It is called, stop that, it is called the Anatomy 152 Exam 1 Study Guide. You can find it on Canvas, both in the announcement section, I've made a new announcement, as well as under the files section, where you can find all the files to all your PowerPoints if you ever have a dead link. And that's all going to be organized by unit. For this one, I just made it unit 00 for exam review material, so that's where you can find this study guide that we're going to be going over. So take a minute to go ahead and find that and open it up. And in the meanwhile, I'm going to get started talking about the autonomic nervous system. Now, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to hop in and ask them at any time um, regarding what's actually specifically going to be on the exam. The way that the exam is structured, before I hop into this, there are 55 questions on the exam, um, but it's graded out of 50 points. So you have a little bit of leeway in terms of maybe making a mistake here or there, or perhaps something being on there that you weren't expecting to be on there, because I may or may not have included it on this what I believe to be comprehensive study guide, but if I did miss something, obviously you guys can let me know. I'm happy to add it for the next semester. Um, but my point is that there's five kind of bonus points written in, so that gives you a little bit of wiggle room for this exam. All right, so it's going to cover, obviously, the autonomic nervous system, special senses, and the endocrine system. So let's just jump right into the autonomic nervous system. Um, as you may recall, the autonomic nervous system functions in maintaining homeostasis in the body. And that's basically going to be coming from a lot of different information from all sorts of both internal and external receptors. So receptors and organs and also um, responsible for making changes in the motor output to affect our organs, which can include, well, is to include all of the organs in your body. And, that's going to include autonomic sensory neurons, which then are going to send information into the central nervous system, and then autonomic motor neurons, which are then going to relay that information to those effector cells. And usually this is going to happen under um, subconscious or involuntary control. So then we talked briefly about um, comparing the somatic and autonomic nervous systems and how the somatic nervous system is a little bit different in that it's under conscious perception and is responsible for innervating your skeletal muscles. So if you're talking about skeletal innervation, you're talking somatic, autonomic is not responsible for skeletal muscle innervation. Um, and that generally almost always results in the excitation. So the effect is always excitory. Whereas the autonomic nervous system has both um, autonomic sensory and motor neurons that are associated generally with your internal organs, your enteroreceptors. It's not necessarily consciously perceived. In fact, most of it is under involuntary control. And it's going to get information from both those special sensory neurons and your, all of your somatic senses. Um, and all these autonomic motor pathways are going to end up either increasing or decreasing specific activities, including your cardiac muscle, your smooth muscle, different glands in your body. And again, most of this is under subconscious control, so you're not able to voluntarily alter it or suppress it. Now these pathways generally have two motor neurons. They always have at least two motor neurons in a series. And remember we talked about them being, um, they could be sympathetic, which are shown here in blue, or they can be parasympathetic. And we talked about them acting on basically the fight or flight or the rest and digest responses. Um, and the sympathetic neurons can innervate either at an autonomic ganglion where they release acetylcholine, or they can innervate at the adrenal medulla, right? The chromaffin cells in the adrenal medulla will respond to the acetylcholine that's released, which then is going to end up circulating in the bloodstream with like more of a global effect. And then the parasympathetic is going to also have that result of having the, the ganglion, right? Here we have the parasympathetic preganglionic neuron running into the ganglion, and then this is the postganglionic neuron. Another thing that we talked about in class was that in all these cases, the preganglionic neuron is myelinated. You can see that by that little yellow myelin sheath, right? And the postganglionic neuron, well, there is no postganglionic neuron because it's a global effect, but in this case, the postganglionic neurons are going to be unmyelinated. Another point of interest is that the effectors of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic pathways often overlap, including glands and cardiac muscle, et cetera, but so often they have opposing effects, depending, of course, on whether you're going down that fight or flight or rest and digest pathway. Um, okay, so let's move on. 
the anatomical components of all of your neurons are going to start with the cell body. Generally, the cell body is either going to be found in the brain or in the spinal cord of the preganglionic neurons, right, the ones that are going to be sending out the information. Um, and then again, those are going to have myelinated axons. Those preganglionic axons are going to be myelinated. And then they're going to synapse with a postganglionic neuron. Postganglionic neuron is going to be entirely outside of the central nervous system, and depending on if it's sympathetic or parasympathetic, it might be closer to or for, farther away from the central nervous system, or it might be closer to its effector cell or further away. Um, but in both cases, they're going to be unmyelinated. That postganglionic neuron is unmyelinated, and it's going to end up synapsing generally at the effector, right? Let's see. Um, let's move on to this image here so while I talk about that. So we talked about how the sympathetic neurons all came out of different regions in the spinal column, right? Sympathetic came out during all of these thoracic and the upper lumbar, whereas the parasympathetic came out, and we'll talk about those in a second, right here, um, comes out in the cranial nerves and then also in the sacral nerves. But they're going to innervate similar organs, right? And then all of these in both cases are going to have a pre and a post ganglionic neuron with a synapse in the center, right? And as we may notice here, we have some outer like trunk regions where these ganglia, it's a ganglion trunk, where they're going to be able to maybe jump up or jump down in terms of one little node before they end up reaching their final innervation destination. Um, all right, I digress. Um, these are often going to be located really close to your large abdominal arteries. In fact, they're often going to have the same names and designations as those major arteries. So that's going to help you be able to orient yourself in terms of where they're located. And again, there's, while there's crosstalk in the, which organs they innervate, there is no crosstalk in where they come out of the spinal column. Um, the postganglionic neurons have multiple different ways that they're able to connect with the preganglionic neurons, right? They can connect within the ganglia. They can connect within the sympathetic chains of the ganglia or in the prevertebral ganglia or within the adrenal medulla. So those are all going to have different ways in which they have effectors. Um, and they all are going to have different effectors. Well, they, sometimes, they will have the same effectors in some cases, but they will have alternating effects depending on whether they're sympathetic or parasympathetic pathways. And we also have plexes, which are basically networks of these parasympathetic and sympathetic neurons. They're major pathways. If we talked about this being like um, a map, remember we had much smaller back streets and then we had larger highways. The larger highways would be the plexes, and there's a ton of autonomic plexes, and these are generally going to be named again based on the region that they service. So as you might imagine, the cardiac autonomic plexus services the heart, um, right, celiac, the stomach, pulmonary, um, the lungs, etc. This is kind of what that looks like. So here are the different here's the esophageal flexus. This here, just to orient you, here's the diaphragm. Um, this is the aorta. Obviously, the heart has been removed in this picture. So of the lungs, um, you can see that there's little major highways or intersections that run on the outer side. These are called the trunk ganglia, and they have these plexus regions that run around certain regions in case that here the esophageal plexus runs around the esophagus, et cetera. Cardiac would run around the heart, pulmonary around the lungs, et cetera. And those are all basically named based on the arteries that they are nearby and the regions that they service. Um, let's see. Um, all right, so we talked about further division of the parasympathetic setup. Right, so we have um, we have the enteric division, which is going to be dividing into main, mainly into the gastrointestinal tract. And when we talk about digestion, this will be something that we'll see a lot. There's a lot of innervation in each of the different regions of the digestive tract. Um, but these are specialized collections of nerves and ganglia that are going to help feed gastrointestinal organs, like and, and accessory organs such as the pancreas and the gallbladder. It has a ton of neurons, over 100 million that approximately the same amount in your spinal column, and we have two different layers in, um, in the tract. We have the my, myenteric and the submucosal plexus, and again, we'll see these again when we talk about digestion, but they're basically going to be found between the muscular layers 
um, in all of the different regions of the digestive tract. And between the myenteric is between the outer longitudinal and circular muscle layers, and the submucosal is between the circular muscle and the muscularis mucosae. Um, all right, so this part here talks about how neurons are going to interact with one another. Some of them are going to release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, right, and some are going to release norepinephrine. If they're cholinergic, they release acetylcholine. That includes both sympathetic and parasympathetic preganglionic neurons and all parasympathetic postganglionic neurons. The parasympathetic pathway only is going to be using acetylcholine. So if you see norepinephrine, you know you're dealing with the sympathetic pathways. Um, and they're going to be defined based on how they interact with one another. So if you were to look at the here's sympathetic division innervation, and this is the only time that you're going to see norepinephrine. Every other time, if you're looking at parasympathetic, you're going to see um, acetylcholine. But even with the sympathetic, in the synapse reason here, the ganglion, you're going to see acetylcholine release. And that's the difference between it being nicotinic, which would be acetylcholine release at the synapse here and here, whether it's sympathetic or parasympathetic. You've got It's at the at the junction between the pre and the post ganglionic um, neurons and it's a release of acetylcholine that's called nicotinic now if you're looking at the effector cell depending on if we're releasing norepinephrine epinephrine right adrenaline basically or if we're releasing acetylcholine that's the difference between adrenergic or responding to adrenaline or norepinephrine or muscaneric which is responding to acetylcholine and as we Recall, we called this muscaneric. It was easy to remember because it affects the sweat glands, with the, which are musky, so that's one of the pneumatic devices for you to help remember. And in the parasympathetic division, we're only able to release acetylcholine, so all of the effector cells are going to be um, have muscaneric receptors. And again, the receptors are actually found on the cells that are being affected, right? So on the postsynaptic neuron or on the effector cell. Because that's where we are going to have the receptors, right? The, the axons here are going to be releasing these neurotransmitters like acetylcholine or norepinephrine. And so the effector cells are the ones that are going to have the receptors. So just to clarify. All right. Oh, we just talked about that. Let's see. You guys have any questions? Um, all right, so the sympathetic response is basically going to be fight or flight. It prepares the body for emergencies. Um, emergency, embarrassment, exercise, and excitement. So all of these are things that can trigger the sympathetic stimulation. Um, sympathetic stimulation has a longer-lasting effect um, for a couple of reasons. One, norepinephrine is going to be degraded more slowly, and also um, the sympathetic system can innervate um, those chromaffin cells and have a global effect. The sympathetic responses are going to include dilated pupils, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, increased blood flow to the kidneys, and um, I'm sorry, decreased blood flow to the kidneys and gastrointestinal tract, and increased blood flow to the skeletal muscles, liver, heart, and fat tissue. Right? We're going to be breaking down fat, basically anything that's going to give us immediate energy to be able to meet the needs of fight or flight. Um, and right along with that, our liver cells are going to be releasing glucose and we're going to be creating new glucose and fat cells are going to be breaking down fat to release triglycerides to increase the amount of energy available. All of that's going to be making it so that we're able to meet the energy demands of something that might be quite grueling in an extreme fight or flight situation. Now the parasympathetic division does the opposite of that. It's going to regulate and conserve body energy. So this is going to be your rest and digest. And um, it's going to last for a little bit shorter and have less widespread. First of all, it's going to be localized and acetylcholine is going to be degraded more quickly than norepinephrine. All of the parasympathetic responses we talked about in class, including salivation, right, digestion, lacrimation or tear ducts, urination, digestion, defecation, etc. All of this is, uh, has to do with water. A lot of this has to do with water in your body, so water retention. Also, on the flip side of the heart rate, um, we're going to have a decreased heart rate and Decreased airway diameter, decreased pupil diameter, etc. during our parasympathetic responses. Um, so all of this is under autonomic control by the hypothalamus. 
So the hypothalamus is what's responsible for controlling and integrating most of the autonomic nervous system. It's connected to both sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. And um, sometimes the autonomic nervous system is controlled by the cerebral cortex during emotional stress times. Okay, so we talked so we're not going to talk about any homeostatic disorders for this. Um, all right, so do you guys have any questions on that before I move on to special senses? I feel like I auctioneer styled that. No one. All right, I will move on. Um, so we next talked about special senses. Um, oh, just to be clear, anything that's in here and anything that's in any of the um, images that are is in this Word document is completely fair game for the examination questions. All right, so when we talked about special senses, we talked about smell, taste, vision, hearing, and equilibrium. And... Um, we jumped right into, well, this here talks about how you actually are able to study these, the actual jobs that would be involved in, so the careers involved in studying these organs. So ophthalmology, for example, deals with the eye and its disorders. Otorhinolaryngology, I think I got close to that, it deals with the ear, nose, throat, and larynx. First, we talked about the sense of smell. We talked about how smell and taste are chemical receptors or chemical senses, but that all of the special senses that we talk about involve taking a signal that is non-electrical and turning it into an electrical signal, whether we do that by way of um, a chemical, like an odorant uh, molecule or a taste molecule, or whether we do that by pressure, or whether we do that by a photo or um, mechanical transduction, any of that still is basically taking in external information and turning it into electrical impulses that our brain can interpret. So we talked about olfactory receptors. This is the olfactory receptor here. It has these um, little dendrites that are in the, um, in the mucus, basically. And an odorant molecule comes up and is going to dissolve in this mucus layer, which then is going to trigger a cascade whereby the um, dendrites are going to pass information into the receptor. The receptor is then going to send that information out through. Remember, this is called the cribiform plate. It has a couple holes in it. It's a nasal epithelium. This goes up into the, um, the cranium. Here is the different regions of the these axons, basically, of olfactory receptors that are going to interact here with the olfactory neurons and send that information out through the olfactory tract. All of that happens in the olfactory bulb. Now, if we look at this actual olfactory epithelium, we don't just have these receptors. These receptors are held up by support cells. Remember, we talked about all receptors being kind of um, princess-like and needing a bunch of support staff. So these physically support them and also aid in all of their physiological needs as well. And then we also have basal cells here, which are stem cells that serve to replenish and re um, any time that these cells here die off. Um, another thing I didn't mention, here's the olfactory gland that's going to make the mucus, which is what the odorant molecules are going to get um, absorbed into. All right, so we talked about how that worked. We talked about all of that. All right. Um, okay, so this is talking about um, a G-coupled protein receptor, basically, that's going to be passing information down. Here is, oh, I see we have questions. Hold on just a second. I'm going to hop over to the chat for a second. No, I can't hear any of you. Um, if you. So if you guys have any questions, you will have to type it in there, or I guess you'll have to unmute yourselves. So I apologize for that. Um, I apologize. So here's the G protein coupled receptor. Basically what happens is you have an odorant molecule that binds to that receptor protein, and then that's going to introduce an intracellular cascade where the G protein is going to convert ATP into cyclic AMP via adenylate cyclase. That's going to then cause the sodium to come in, which is, as you may recall, is what causes um, the change in the concentration of positive ions on either side of the membrane is what causes an action potential. Right, that's called depolarization. And when you have enough change from one side to the other, that um, action potential can then get triggered and get passed along to the olfactory receptor. Back to the chat. Sometimes a shortcut. 
Oh, a sh like it, that it takes a shortcut. So um, that's not going to be something that I don't believe there's a question on the exam. But yes, there is a way that it can, instead of relaying information all the way up to the brain, it will then relay information through the spinal column to kind of like a secondary command center that then just that sends that information back down and out again so it doesn't actually even have to bother the actual control center of the brain. Um, but I don't believe there's a specific question on that. Does anybody else have questions on the autonomic nervous system while we're... I apologize that I moved on to special senses before. Nope. All right. I'm going to close that and move on. Um, anyway, so that's how the action potential is actually generated from a odorant molecule. Um, okay, so gustation is the, our ability to sense taste. It's going to work very similarly to smell in that we have a chemical molecule that has to be dissolved in a liquid medium. Um, five major primary tastes, sour, sweet, bitter, salty, and umami. Um, other tastes are going to include any combination of those tastes, anything else that you taste is basically just going to be all of those five primary, five primary tastes in combination. Uh, and again, here we have our receptors, so our gustatory receptor cell, these are the support cells, the basal cells which are going to be replenishing them, so again these are the princess cells, these are going to be the cells that are um, the, the handmaids basically, and these are the receptors, I'm sorry, the basal cells. Questions? The beta and alpha receptors. Um, so I'm not going to go specifically into beta and alpha receptors and which is responsible for what in terms of the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. Is that what you're asking? So no, I don't have any questions on the difference between what beta 1 or et cetera is responsible for. I just want you to know globally what the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems are going to do in terms of the effector organs and also the major pathways, right? Upregulate or downregulate digestion, for example. Upregulate or downregulate circulation, right? For the fight or flight, it's going to end up increasing blood volume, which is going to be part of the water retention pathways and going to decrease, for example, the uh, increase the amount of glucose that's going to be created and stop digestion of glucose, right? Um, so no, the answer is no. The beta and alpha receptors are not going to be specifically um, asked about on the exam, but the global overview of the different pathways and how they affect the effector organs and the effective organ systems is. Is that a fair answer to that question? Okay, anybody else feel free to hop in with any questions as we go along. Um, okay, so to go back to gustation, basically just like we saw with olfaction, we have um, information that's going to come in as a chemical molecule that's going to, in this case, be dissolved across the tongue and end up getting the ability to trigger these gustatory microvilli, which are attached to these gustatory receptor cells which then triggers a cascade where the sensory neurons then send that information out into the brain. Again, the basal cells are the stem cells that are going to be there to replenish the receptor cells, and the, um, re these here are the supporting cells, are literal physical and also electrical insulation. I might not have mentioned that previously. Um, it's going to help keep the two of them that are next to each other from triggering one to the other, so we're going to be able to independently trigger these receptors. Um, <clears throat> All right, so we have taste buds that are found inside um, these little regions of the tongue that are called papillae. Um, and we have different types of papillae. They're called circumvallate, fungiform, and folate papillae. We also have filiform um, papillae. And they're going to be found here. So here's the valate papillae. They're the largest ones. These guys are going to have 300 or so um, taste buds each. So again, if we compare these in class, we compare these to like the density of the city versus the density of the country. These ones on the side, the foliate papillae, are the ones that lose the taste buds um, in early teenagehood. So this is when people's tastes change and they start to like things like Brussels sprouts and mushrooms that previously might have had really bitter, overwhelming flavor for them because these these taste buds in here were able to detect those taste buds, uh, those flavors that the adult palate is unable to detect. Um, and then we also, again, had the filiform papillae, 
which didn't have any but were responsible for being able to move food around in the mouth and for diction, etc. Um, so I talked about this when I talked about the previous slide, but basically an, a chemical molecule gets dissolved in saliva and is going to end up in touch with the microvilli, the gustatory microvilli, which causes a receptor potential, which causes the neurotransmitters to be released that is going to cause a firing of the nerve impulse. And then these first order sensory neurons are going to synapse with the gustatory receptor cells. Um, and then this talks about how that works. So sodium ions and salty food are going to enter the gustatory receptor cells. That happens through sodium channels. And hydrogen ions and sour tastants enter via hydrogen channels. Um, there is a question on this. I know I didn't harp on this in class, but there is one question um, on the difference between how salty foods and sour foods are going to be, um, how they're going to have that information transmitted into the cell. Um, okay, so this is the gustatory pathway, and again, I'm not going to harp on the connections between where everything ends up in the brain, but what I want you to know is with all of these special senses, information comes in, again, through the receptors that then are going to interact, so those are first order, they interact with the second order neurons, and then they go out through the nervous system and are going to have an area where they're going to basically have the data I don't want to say dropped off, but this is the data dump, right? And then from there, that data is going to have to get interpreted. So that information is going to go, in the case of the gustatory pathway, pathway um, it's going to go up into the gustatory nucleus, then into the thalamus, into the, and then that's basically where we're going to have that information dropped off, and then it's going to be sent on to processing for the primary gustatory area, and that happens in the cerebral cortex. Um, this is all going to be brought into the brain by way of the vagus nerve for everything in the back of the mouth and the throat. Um, the back part of the tongue goes in through that glossopharyngeal nerve, the back one-third, and the front two-thirds is going to go in through the facial nerve. Um, okay, so that is it for taste. Do we have any questions on taste before I move on to vision? I'll give you guys a second to type. All right, I'll take that as a no. <clears throat> All right, so vision is a little bit more, well, it's a lot more complex um, than the other, the chemical senses that we just talked about, but it's going to be very similar in that we're, again, taking information from the external environment and then turning it into an electrical um, impulse. In this case, it's a photoreceptor that is doing this, so we're taking photons of light and then turning them into electrical, um, electrical impulse, and we can only do that in the visible light spectrum is going to include all the colors of the rainbow. Outside of that, as we talked about in class, going to include things like gamma, UV, microwaves, and radio waves, all things that we're not able to actually see because they're not going to be light wavelengths that are going to be able to appropriately be perceived by our visual spectrum. Um, before we hop into it, we talked about all the accessory structures, including the eyebrow, the eyelash, um, the palpebra. We have the upper and the lower. That's the eyelid. Here's the lacrimal caruncle, part of the lacrimal apparatus or the tear duct apparatus. This medial commissure is the area where we're going to have the, um, the upper and the lower eyelid kind of coming together. Medial and the lateral commissures are going to be where we have the upper and the eye lower eyelid coming together. If we're looking at the eye itself, this is the iris or the colored part. It's going to upper, um, open and close by way of two different sets of muscles, circular and radio muscles, that's going to change the size of the pupil, which the pupil is actually a lack of tissue. It's a hole in the iris that allows light to penetrate through. Um, we talked about the muscles on either side, above and below the eye, right? that includes the inferior, superior, lateral, and medial rectus muscle. Obviously, lateral and medial are not depicted here. Um, also the orbicularis oculi muscle and the levitator palpebra superior muscle and inferior muscle. Those are going to help with moving the, um, moving the eyelids up and down. Here we have the eyelashes, which are going to be our first line of defense for any large foreign bodies entering the eye. Um, and then behind that, so we're going to enter into, we have the cornea. Then we are going to have, this is the, um, the anterior chamber. Then we have the iris, the posterior chamber, the lens, and then this here is the vitreous humor and the vitreous cavity. The back is where we have the retina and is our photoreceptive layer. We'll talk about that in a second. Any questions on that so far?
All right, this is the lacrimal apparatus. You should know the pathway of tears. First, it's going to go through the lacrimal gland, gland which swells up and secretes the tears through the lacrimal duct. Then that goes out through either the superior or inferior lacrim lacrimal caniculi here and here, draining tears into the lacrimal sac, um, which is here, or out in through this lacrimal puncta. And it also is going to then fill up in the nasolacrimal sac, which then goes out through the nasolacrimal duct and drains into the nasal cavity. Um, this is going to talk about the pathway that light takes through the lens. We've also introduced a couple more pieces of information here than we did previously. Basically, this is the visual axis of light. It's going to come in, obviously, through the the cornea here. The cornea is then going to sit on top of the anterior chamber. Then we have the iris. There's a hole in the iris called the pupil. Behind that we have the posterior chamber. Then we have the lens. All of these are going to have fluids that have different viscosities. As the light goes through those viscosities, it refracts or bends. Hopefully, if we have good vision allowing us to focus here in this region here, which is the fovea centralis of the macula lutea. This is our highest point of visual acuity on this area here, which is called the retina or a photoreceptive layer. Um, some other things of interest that are not our photoreceptive layer include our choroid layer. That choroid layer is going to be where we have a ton of vasculature. We also have the sclera, which is, I may have mentioned here is the white part of the eye, and it's going to cover the entire, not only the eyeball itself, but also the optic nerve, so it's going to be a, a highly protective layer. Um, we also have these special ciliary bodies and ciliary muscle which are going to allow us to distend the lens when we squint to allow us to change our vision just a little bit to change where the light is going to end up hitting so if it's a little bit off we might be able to focus it a little bit more clearly here again in that fovea centralis this is our optic nerve there's a blind spot here because it's the only region of the photoreceptive layer that doesn't have photoreceptors and that's because that's where all the nerves are going to fall out or not fall out run out um, as well as uh, we have our region of our central retina artery and vein so there's some central vasculature that runs through that as well um, so we're able to split the parts of the eye up into the fibrous tunic, which is, has the protective layer that I talked about, the sclera, and also the cornea, which is clear, and that allows the light to go through, but it also is going to um, have uh, the, con um, the conjunctiva on top of it, which allows it, hopefully, to be a protective layer. That's our first layer of protection if it does get past the eyelashes. Um, we also have the vascular tunic, which has the choroid portion, and also the ciliary body and the iris portion. Uh, we talked about what these layers do already. Let's see, the iris is going to be the colored part of the eye that has two different sets of muscles. Here we have the circular and the radial muscles, and depending on how we contract or constrict them, we'll have different sizes of our pupil. Um, here's under normal light, bright light, the pupil is constricted, giving us tiny pinpoint. In dim light, we have very large pupils um, where the pupils are dilated. Obviously, we talked about in class that this can be also a symptom of um, someone's either mental health or perhaps um, drug-induced state if we see that they have dilation or um, constriction of the pupils it's abnormally associated with the light of the room that they're in um, okay so this is the neural layer of the retina basically light again it's going to come through and it's going to focus here on this this region of the retina that's going to have our photoreceptors. We have a pigmented region behind it. The pigmented region is going to basically help absorb any scattered light or any stray light rays. And then that neural portion here has three major layers, the photoreceptor cell layer, the bipolar cell layer, and the ganglion cell layer, um, separated into two zones, the outer and inner synaptic layers. And that's where, again, where our synapses are made, which makes sense. That looks kind of like this. Again, here's our pigmented layer to help absorb any scattered light. Um, this is our photoreceptor cell layer where we have our photoreceptors. Again, they look very much like what we described them as rods and or cones. Cones color complicated. Cones are going to be responsible for color vision. Each cone can only do one color. So if this is a green cone, it's only going to be responsible for green light. This one, red cone, only responsible for red light, etc. We have green, red, and blue, only three options. Um, but I digress. So the photoreceptor cell layer here is going to interact directly with the outer synaptic layer. And this is where we have both horizontal cells, which are going to communicate across. So in this case, we're going to fire not just this rod, but also the, some of the surrounding rods. And then additionally, we have those bipolar cells, which are going to help connect with the ganglion 
cells in the ganglion cell layer and pass that information out through the optic nerve axons, which will eventually head towards the optic nerve, which goes out through that optic disc. Okay, again, those major cell layers include the photoreceptor cell layer, the outer and inner synaptic cell layer, which are separated by the bipolar cell layer. On the outside of that, the ganglion cell layer, which would be where we actually have the interaction of the bipolar cells, which are the ones that are going to be interacting here with the ganglion cells, sending that information out through the optic nerve axons. So that's the actual direction of nerve impulses through the retina. Okay. Um, so this is showing you that the light direction is actually coming from, so if we were to scroll back up here, the light is actually coming from this direction and then triggering these receptors, which transmit that information back out this direction. And that's why the pigmented cell layer can catch anything that's scattered backwards so that it doesn't bounce back and then also send that information a second time. This is the difference between rods and cones. Again, rods are going to be black and white. Cones color more complicated. Um, they're going to have discs in the rods and folds in the cones, but they're going to basically work in a very similar ma manner in that they have these opsin molecules. In the case of the rods, it's rhodopsin, but there's other types of colorized opsin that are going to be found in the cones. And um, again, we have three major types of cones, blue, green, and red, and they're only going to be sensitive to one. So not that each cone is going to detect all three colors. A red cone will detect red light, a blue cone will detect blue light, etc. And our color vision is an interpretation of all three of those types of cones. Um, okay, so let's see. This is a little is a closer up view of the ciliary bodies, and this, which includes the ciliary muscles and the ciliary process, which are involved in contraction of the lens or a contraction of the zona, zonular fibers that touch the lens, which allow us to kind of squint, if you will. Um, it also is going to show you the anterior chamber, which sits just underneath the cornea and on, is on top of the iris. What else are we showing? Here's the conjunctiva, which again, as I said, is that area that's going to be the most protective layer that's hopefully going to catch any dust or foreign bodies that make it through the eyelashes. And then this is where the sclera is going to start. That's the white of the eye. The clear part of the eye, again, is the cornea part. We have to let the light through. Behind the lens, we have the vitreous chamber, which has the vitreous body. And if you haven't had the chance to do the dissection in the lab, you should, um, if you get the chance, you should do that before you take this exam. That will really help you in terms of orientation of the eye and the different parts of the eye. Um, okay, we talked about that. Um, this talks about how the light comes in. So if the light is coming off a distant object, it comes in close enough to parallel to appear to be parallel. If it comes in off a far or cl close object, it's going to have divergent rays, um, which means that we're going to have to change the shape of the lens to be able to focus on things that are far away versus close by. Um, but either way, the information is going to then get sent, again, through the cornea, through the anterior chamber, through the iris, through the lens, well, through the hole in the iris called the pupil, through the lens, through the vitreous humor, to the retina, to the photoreceptor, la or, so, photoreceptor layer of the retina. And then here, it's, this is also depicting that it's shown inverted and left to right. So it's shown up, down, and left to right inverted. So they're upside down uh, and left, right reversed. So we have to focus on near and far objects differently, and we do that by using the ciliary muscles that allows the lens to either flatten or contract a little bit based on the tension from the zonular fibers, which I just tried to show you. Um, if we have abnormal vision, so we can be nearsighted or farsighted, um, this is what normal vision looks like. The light rays come in, get refracted through the cornea, get refracted again through the lens, and then through the vitreous humor, where they're going to end up um, merging on the retina layer. If, however, they merge either too far in front, which would be uh, myopic, or too far behind, which would be hyperoptic, so this is farsighted, this is nearsighted, then we have to use corrective lenses. We use either concave or convex lenses to help change the direction of the light coming into the eye such that it is focused correctly on the retinal layer so that the interpretation can be made without being blurry. Um, okay. So we talked about the physiology of vision, and that looks kind of like this. So this is a rod. Cones work similarly, except instead of using rhodopsin, they use variant types of opsin molecules that are specialized for their wavelength or color of light. 
Um, and they also are going to use a coil instead of these discs, but they have similar um, reaction. So let's just talk about the black and white vision. Basically what happens is in order for this to happen, we have to have our dominoes set up. What do I mean by that? I mean that this is a reaction that can only occur once before it has a lag time where the dominoes have to be reset before it can occur again. What does it look like when it's all set up? So we have a cis retinol, which is bent, sitting inside an opsin molecule. It's going to be photoresponsive. That means that when light comes in, it's going to allow itself to undergo isomerization or a change in shape. Once it's straightened out, it's going to be allowed to slip out or separate from opsin. That's called bleaching. And now opsin is going to be a colorless product, which then has to wait for the conversion of retinol back to the cis form and popping that back into the opsin molecule in order to become photoreceptive again, right, to be able to react to the light again. So each of these different molecules is basically waiting for a trigger from light so that it can isomerize the retinol, to lose the retinol, to be able to have this trigger. And that's going to cause the information to get then sent out as a neural impulse. Um, and my point is that there's a little bit of time here that's a lag time in which these are not going to be able to be responsive to the next light stimulus. We talked about the difference between light and dark adaptation, um, how there's a couple things that have to happen. First, obviously, your pupil has to change in size, and that may take a second. And secondarily, because of that photo bleaching time lag that I talked about, sometimes the regeneration can't keep up with the photo bleaching process. Um, and also that in dark settings, mo mainly it's going to be the rods that we're using. Whereas in daylight, rods don't contribute very much, and we're going to be using the cones very much for color vision. So mainly the color vision is daytime, and black and white is, is nighttime or dark vision. Additionally, we have to slow down the signal that gets sent out during um, dark pathways. So in the dark, we have to kind of fine-tune the information that is sent through this receptor layer. And we do that by creating more of a chemical called glutamate. So in the light, glutamate is actually turned off, which means that the excitation of this chemical signal can get, I'm sorry, this chemical signal can get passed on very quickly, right? That means that the receptor potential, this hyperpolarization action potential can get sent out quickly. But when we have a ton of this glutamate, that's going to slow this receptor down. So in the dark, well, we still have the upper upstream parts of this pathway, right? We trigger the sodium channels opening by the cyclic GMP gated um, cyclic GMP pathway that's going to bring in more sodium, which is going to cause that membrane potential to get to negative 30, which is going to induce what would previously be that pathway, right? It would previously induce the action potential we passed on. Instead, because we have glutamate, glutamate is going to slow that down a little bit. And that's going to help us differentiate between kind of dark really dark and super extra dark so that we're able to help um, distinguish in a dark movie theater, for example, which seat is empty and which seat has someone sitting in it. Right, and then again works through glutamate, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that basically slows the role of the photoreceptors to allow us to fine tune the dark vision. Um, okay, so we also talked about having binocular vision, and we have binocular vision because our left and our right eyeballs see a little bit differently. Um, and that's because we have overlap here in the binocular vision field, which is where our main center of vision or our um, highest level of visual acuity is found. But we also have peripheral vision from our left eye that is separate from the peripheral vision of the right eye. Um, just to be clear here, our blind spots are going to be found here and here, right? There and here, and that means that the left eye is going to compensate for the blind spot of the right eye, and the right eye compensated for the blind spot of the left eye, etc. I also want to point out that the left visual field of both eyes, here and here, is going to go to the right brain, and the right visual field of both eyes is going to go to the left brain. So it's not that the left eye goes right brain and the right eye goes left brain, it's that everything that you see on the left side of your face from the left and the right eye goes to the right brain, and everything you see on the right side of your face from the right and, I'm sorry, the right and the left eye, goes to the left side of the brain. Once it goes into the brain, it's going to go into the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. Again, this is the information dump, if you will. Then that information is going to get processed by these optic radiation 
to the primary visual cortex. All right, I see some questions. I'm going to take a break for a second. Oh, no, that's fine. Of course, it's all being recorded, so you're welcome to come back later. Um, okay, so the cat's ability to adapt to light has something to do with that extra layer that we saw when we did the cow eye dissection. It also is like when you shine a flashlight in the bushes and you see like a cat or a raccoon, you have like a reflective layer that's going to bounce back. You wouldn't see that from a human. Um, and that's because humans lack that particular layer and it's specific for dark vision. Um, and exactly how it works, I don't know specifically, but you're welcome to look up that layer and how that layer gives um, certain animals a better response to dark vision. All right, close that back down. Okay, moving on here. Uh, okay, again, everything in the left half of both the left and the right eyes gets processed on the right side. Everything on the right half of both the left and the right eyes gets processed on the left sides. Okay. Um, I think that's everything for vision. So do we have any more questions on vision? All right, I know it's not like a lecture where there's an official ending. I'm just kind of throwing all the information out at you. Um, so we'll move on to hearing and equilibrium. So three major subdivisions of the ear, the external, the middle, and the internal. The external is basically everything that you can pierce, plus the um, auditory canal. So that's going to include here the auricle, which includes the helix and the lobule. Um, remember, this is going to inclu include fat tissue as well as cartilage. Remember we talked about like rhinoplasty or some other corrective surgeries. Sometimes they'll take cartilage from the same individual from their ear and use it to help reconstruct their nose. Um, that's because there's plenty of cartilage in this ear region. Again, that's going to be the auricle, and this here is the external auditory canal. It goes all the way to the tympanic membrane, and then that's going to be where we enter into the middle ear. Um, information is going to get passed from the tympanic membrane from the malus, incus, and stapes, amplified 20-fold, go through that oval window in the vestibule and then head up into the cochlea where pressure waves are going to be detected as we go back up and then down this organ. There's a spiral organ of corgi in between the up and down staircase that helps us to help detect those pressure changes. Um, so this is all involved in hearing. This side here um, is all going to be involved in equilibrium, but I kind of have digressed because that's all organs of the inner ear. Um, all right, so here's what happens in the middle ear. Again, the tympanic membrane is where the Waves of air pressure are going to be interpreted as sound waves when they pass through this tympanic membrane. That's going to get amplified by the malus, the incus, and the stapes. As you can see, they're held by these really teeny tiny little ligaments, so really um, precision, which allows for those vibrations to be um, amplified without actually being inserted. Notice it's not actually inserted in the temporal bone, even though it is going to sit right next to it. Again, the amplification occurs and goes all the way out here through the stapes into the oval window and then it's going to head into the inner ear for interpretation. Other things here in this middle area is that auditory tube, which is how you would like equalize your ears if you want to, were on an airplane or scuba diving or whatnot. Um, oh, and then there's a special muscle here too, this tensor tympani muscle, um, and that's also going to be part of what you can do when you equalize your ears. You can kind of flex that oddly to open this up. Um, moving on to the inner ear, the inner ear has what we call, what I call the snail-shaped organ, right? This is going to be the cochlea that's going to be involved in hearing. The vestibule is involved in um, equilibrium. It's the vestibular cochlear organ. It has nervous nerves that are going to innervate both sections that are going to be involved in both hearing and balance. Um, again, this is going to be where the stapes is going to have um, information come in. It's going to be a vibrations, again, 20-fold stronger than when they came in from the tympanic membrane. And they're going to head up. In class, we called it up a, spiral uh, up a spiral staircase and then down a spiral staircase. Um, but we know that that's actually going to be named based on, here we go as we move down, based on where it's located. So as we go up, that's the, um, the scala vestibuli. Headed up, going down is the scala tympani, and that's because the information coming up is coming from the vestibule, and going down it's headed towards a secondary tympanic membrane, which is here the um, the round window has a secondary tympanic membrane, and that's where any extra vibrations are going to be released or extra pressure is going to be um, kind of uh, it, it, that's already been interpreted is not going to be interpreted twice, so it's going to be released from there. Inside these two spiral organs, well, it's one spiral organ, but in the middle of that spiral organ. We have the um, spiral organ of corgi here, 
that's going to have a separate set of fluid. So as you may remember, this has perilymph, perilymph this is going to have endolymph. And as the information goes up in one layer of the perilymph and then down, remember it's going to go by way of the helicotrema is the very top of that spiral staircase before you start heading back down. Um, and I will just move a little forward to this image here. So again, this is scalar vestibuli, the upper staircase, and it's going to go back down this lower staircase. And in between here, we have the cochlear duct, which contains a different liquid. This is endolymph. And a specialty organ here called the organ of Corgi that has both a basilar membrane and a tectoral membrane and some specialty um, cells kind of inside there that look like this. So there's a tectoral membrane. It sits on top of these little hair fibers that have stereocilia. The stereocilia actually directly interact with the tectoral membrane. On the bottom is the basilar membrane. Just like any receptor cells, right, these guys need support cells. So we have a ton of supporting cells that are going to help um, keep these hair cells in place. And we also have an inner hair cell. So these are the outer hair cells that are going to be connected to the tectoral membrane on this side. We also have that inner hair cell, which is going to take that information that comes from the basically the change in angle of these hair cells of, based on how the tectoral membrane is vibrating or moving. And then that's going to get sent out through the cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. So it's kind of an overview. So information comes in in pressure waves, which are known as sound waves. They go across the tympanic membrane. Note that this is at an angle, so we can get sound waves that are at different lengths. Um, and those sound waves are going to get transmitted to the malus incus and then stapes. The stapes um, hammers on or vibrates on an oval window. That oval window is going to send vibrations into the perilymph. That perilymph is going to go up the spiral staircase in the scala vestibuli, meet at the helicotrema, and then go back down the spiral staircase in the scala tympani, and then get released here at the tympanic membrane. Um, while we are going up and down, there's going to be pressure changes that are detected here. Remember, we have perilymph in gray, endolymph in red, and those pressure changes are going to get detected by that special spiral organ in the middle there across that basal membrane in the way that we just talked about. Okay, we have innervation in all of that, so lots of nerves that are going to run in that spiral organ. All that's going to get sent out through the cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. And we also have information coming in from the vestibular branch, which we haven't really talked about yet. Uh, they're going to be innervations at the ampullary region, so at the ampulla of each of these different, um, each of these different, remember we called them X, Y, Z axes. And they're going to have ampulla at the bottom. And we'll talk about the orientation and how they work in just a second as I move forward. Oh, um, this is the auditory pathway. So if we're talking about the cochlear information. It comes from the cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve, travels up into the medulla oblongata and the cerebellum, and then ends up in the medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, and then it gets sent out to the auditory area in the cerebral cortex for processing. Um, okay, so let's talk about balance, right? So as I mentioned, we have these, um, the ampulla regions, which are found at the very bottom of our XYZ oriented loops. And at, we also have these organs that are saccual and utricle. These are called otolithic organs. We talked about this being a really weird process whereby we have these um, otoliths or tiny little boulders basically that sit on top of the otolithic membrane. So these are calcium carbonate crystals that sit on top of an otolithic membrane. Inside that membrane, we also on the bottom side have hair bundles, which come off of hair cells. And again, as this moves one direction or the other based on the weight, right, if you change your orientation, this is going to slosh one way or another, that's going to change the, the angle at which these little hair cells, hair bundles on the hair cells are interacting with the autolithic membrane, which sends information out through the vestibular cochlear nerve. Okay, this is just up close. Um, view. So otoliths again on top, otolithic membrane underneath there. Um, as we change orientation, the otoliths will move left, right, up, etc. And that will cause an angular change in these little hair bundles of the hair cells, which will send information out. Now, we also have, so remember I told you we have the XYZ, the semicircular ducts. We just talked about the saccule and utric uh, utricle. Um, we also, of these semicircular ducts, we have the ampulla regions which have specialty regions called cristae, 
And these are going to be involved in acceleration and deceleration, basically. It's going to allow you to rotate your head one direction or another and detect that you are rotating your head. It works very similarly, except we don't have a full membrane. We have these this copula. So there's little hair bundles that are in these copula regions. And the copula is found in that whole ampulla. That whole ampulla is filled with endolymph. As you move your head left, right, etc., that's going to have a little bit of a lag or a drag through that endolymph, which is going to result in a, um, a change in the angles of these hair bundles, and that's going to get interpreted again by the hair cells sent out through the ampullary nerve. Um, okay, so the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve is then going to go into um, the posterior nucleus of the thalamus, and then just like everything else, get interpreted in the cerebral cortex and the vestibular area of the cerebral cortex. All right, question. Um, so static and dynamic equilibrium are basically the difference between motion and not motion. So if you're standing still, even with your eyes completely shut, you know exactly where you are relative to the floor, relative to the couch, etc. And that's all based on gravity, right? So that's basically going to say um, where you are let me go back up to these guys, in X, Y, and Z planes, right, where these are as your norm. And that's static equilibrium. But we also have rotational or accelerational equilibrium. That's called dynamic equilibrium when you're moving. And that's the going to tell you whether or not you're moving quickly or slowly. Are you falling? Not just where you are in the actual space, but where you are in space relative to where you were one second ago. And that's all going to happen in the ampular region. So... I hope that answers the question. All right, fantastic. This. Um, okay, again, that's going to end up being interpreted in the vestibular area, vestibular area of the cerebral cortex. We did not talk about development of the eyes and ears, so you don't need to study that for the exam. Um, there are a couple things that happen as you get older in terms of hearing and vision loss. Um, and we did talk about those in class, including loss of lens elasticity or presbyopia, loss of the transparency of the lens or cataracts, and then also discoloration or overgrowth of the sclera, iris muscle weakenings, less tear production, etc. Um, we also talked about how we might have issues with equilibrium or at least response to equilibrium, particularly dynamic equilibrium as you get older because we might end up with issues in those otoliths and those otolith receptors. Less and less of those might mean that we might respond less quickly. Oh, and some different infections can happen. Anytime you have itis, it means infection, and otitis would be of the auto pathway, would be of the, um, in the middle ear, basically. Usually it's caused by bacteria or virus and is characterized by nose and throat infections. Um, okay, so I feel like I've been talking for a while, but it's only been an hour, so I think we're still okay. Do we have any questions on special senses before I move on to endocrine system? Give you a couple seconds to go ahead and type anything you might have in there. Okay, we do have a question. Um, so yes, you can picture that you had something kind of swinging from the ceiling, right, in the, on, a, on a string. Sorry, the question is, do the hair cells always bend in the opposite directions? And basically the answer is yes, because if you were to move left, it moves right, if that makes sense, because there's a little bit of a drag. So let me go back here. Um, so as you were to move your head in this direction, these guys would end up moving the opposite direction because of the fact that there's a little bit of lag to them. So if you could picture that you had like, I don't know, fibers in a swimming pool or something, as you moved through the water, because the endolymph is pretty thick, it takes a second for them to catch up. So this moves faster than the fibers do, and that causes a change in the, um, in the bending, basically, in the angle at which these hair cells and the hair fibers are going to be interacting. So yes, they always bend in the opposite direction of your motion, but your brain interprets that signal very easily. And of course, you're getting that signal from all of the ampulla at the same time. So you're getting that signal from the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis all at the same time. So that gives you three-dimensional space and also, again, rotational, like not just where you are now, but where you are relative to where you were. Good question.
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the endocrine system. Um, so the, between the nervous system and the endocrine system, all of the body functions are going to um, be coordinated to maintain, again, homeostasis. Endocrine system releases hormones, so it's under hormonal control. And between the two of them, that's called the neuroendocrine neuro system. And the nervous system can help either stimulate or inhibit the release of hormones. And hormones can also help stimulate or um, inhibit the release of other hormones or the generation of nerve impulses. So this is showing you um, the exocrine glands themselves, or the endocrine glands, I'm sorry. Endocrine, and we'll talk about the difference between exocrine and endocrine in just a second. But the ones that we'll talk about for the endocrine glands include the thyroid and the parathyroid gland, the adrenal gland, the pineal gland, hy um, the hypothalamus and pituitary gland system. Here's the thyroid gland here. And we have two main types of glands, exocrine and endocrine. And basically, exocrine glands are going to secrete their products into ducts. Remember when we talked about um, the olfactory equilibrium, er, um, endothelium, sorry, the olfactory endothelium, and we had the release of the mucus, that's going to be an exocrine gland, secreting it into the ducts, and the secretions then go to the target site via the duct. Endocrine glands do not have ducts, and they secrete their hormones directly into the interstitial fluid. As you may remember, we have the blood fluid, right? We also have the interstitial fluid, which is in between the blood and the cells. And then we have the cytoplasmic fluid, which is inside the cells. And these are all aqueous solutions that are very similar, but a little bit different in concentration of, well, everything, basically. Um, and that's how things are going to leave the blood supply, get into the um, interstitial, and then into the cytoplasmic fluid. It's basically by hijacking the, the network of capillaries, et cetera, and using them as a mechanism to be transported throughout until they're going to diffuse out into the interstitial fluid. Some, endo um, sorry, endo some endocrine glands are going to include the pituitary gland, the thyroid, the parathyroid, adrenal, pancreas, kidneys, uh, several gastrointestinal organs like the pancreas, um, and also the pineal glands. Now, when we talk about hormones, hormones are going to be circulated molecules, also known as ligands, that are going to bind to specific receptors. Now, ligands and receptors have specific lock and key shapes. So when you see this, this is so oversimplified. It's actually a very complex three-dimensional molecule, like, a, you know, basically a lock and a key. So only, only hormone A binds to hormone receptor A. Now, we're constantly making receptors and breaking receptors down, so it's under constant flux. And we do that in response to the hormone levels. So if we have too much of the hormone present, we can downregulate or, like, slow our response to that hormone. If we don't have a lot of that hormone present, we might upregulate the receptors in anticipation of trying to um, catch as many of the hormones as possible. So we can up or down regulate the receptor concentration based on several things, including hormone concentration. Now, again, hormones are going to be released from location A and then travel to another location and act on a different target cell. Sometimes they do that by traveling through the blood and acting on distant target cells. It's kind of a global effect, or it'll uh, act on many sometimes effectors. And again, these are circulating hormones. They're called endocrines. We also have local hormones that are going to act on a local level, like the paracrine, which are going to act to a nearby target cell, and an autocrine, which is going to act on its own cell. And we kind of made the difference between, like, the USPS, which is going to deliver letters to the entire United States. That would be like a hormone that gets into the blood supply and has kind of a global effect. It can go wherever, and it will hit its target, or whichever cells have that target re uh, receptor. Or the paracrine is more like the apartment newsletter. It gets to everybody's mailbox if you live in the apartment, but it doesn't make it past the block. And this autocrine cell is like leaving yourself a to-do list for tomorrow or a grocery list that's going to basically be something that's used by the same cell that creates it. That's called autocrine. Um, all right, we also have different chemical classes of hormones based on whether or not they are lipid or water-soluble. As you might imagine, because the blood is an aqueous solution, the water-soluble hormones are able to travel through the plasma without any problem, but lipid-soluble hormones are going to have to bind to transport proteins. What does that look like? Something like this. So as you might see here, this is a, a lipid hormone, and it's not going to be able to go very well through the blood supply, so it's going to have to be carried by an amphipathic molecule, like a transport protein, that kind of hides the fact that it doesn't interact well in aqueous solution. Then it's going to diffuse out, 
But because it's a lipid-soluble hormone, it can go through these plasma membranes, no problem. It can go through the cytoplasmic membrane. It can go through the nuclear membrane. And therefore, it can get all the way into the genetic material itself to alter gene expression. And it can do that inside the nucleus, right? That means that it can alter the level of DNA that's created for whatever its, its uh, effector is, or mRNA, and that's also going to lead to a change in, obviously, the protein, right? DNA, mRNA makes protein. So that in this fashion, it goes directly into the nucleus to be able to up or down regulate whatever its target is. However, water-soluble hormones work a little bit differently. And water-soluble hormones, although they're able to travel through the blood supply, no problem. They can extravate and get to that target cell, but they cannot get through this membrane very well because that membrane's a lipid, right? And so it's going to have to bind to a receptor on the surface of the cell. Now this receptor is often not going to take that hormone in, but instead pass information along. So instead of if you were to say that this actually, this guy actually comes into the house and sits down at the dinner table to discuss information with the head of the family, right, to change the DNA, and RNA, etc. This one only knocks on the door and passes the information on to the butler. The butler passes the information on to the maid who passes the information on to the head of the family. Does that make sense? So this water-soluble hormone has to interact with the receptor. The receptor is a G-protein coupled receptor, which means that it's going to take ATP. So it's going to take energy. And once that ATP is broken down, it creates cyclic AMP or a secondary messenger molecule. That's then going to go on to you know, another secondary molecule, in this case, protein kinases. So we're going to activate protein kinases. Those activated protein kinases can then phosphorylate different cellular proteins, leading to phosphorylated proteins. And then we have phosphorylated proteins, then we induce physiological reactions. So most proteins can be activated by phosphorylation or deactivated by phosphorylation, um, depending on where the phosphorylated site is. But I digress. My point is that the water-soluble hormones are only going to be able to interact at the surface and cause an intracellular cascade, whereas the lipid-soluble hormones are actually able to get into the actual cell itself and interact with the DNA. Okay. All right. So now there's a lot of ways that hormones can interact, but it all comes down to concentrations. Basically, the responsiveness of the cell to the hormone depends on two things, the concentration of the hormone and the abundance of the hormone receptors on the target cell as well as, I guess, three things, the influence exerted by other hormones. And as I mentioned, there's three hormonal interactions. We didn't really talk much about permissive. That just means that it, one does not interfere with the other. But we talked about synergistic and antagonistic. And in class, we said that if someone came and knocked on your door and said, hey, I smell smoke, and was kind of concerned that there might be a fire in the neighborhood, that might get your senses alarmed a little bit. But when a second person came and knocked on your door, your reaction would change based on what they said. If that first person knocked on the door and said, hey, sorry about the smoke from my barbecue. I just lit it. It should pass soon. Then you might relax, right? That would be an antagonistic effect. One person said, I'm worried. The other person said, don't worry about it. But if the second person came and knocked on the door and said, you should better evacuate because a street down, uh, a house down the street is on fire and there's a lot of, I don't know, about chemicals in it or it's bad news, it's going to blow up, that would be a synergistic effect. That would be the two people knocking on your door additively created um, more of a reaction than you would have had by itself. So synergistic is additive and antagonistic is when you're working against each other. Um, so hormone secretion is controlled by multiple stimuli, signals from the nervous system, signals from the chemical changes in your blood, other hormones, again, that antagonistic or synergistic effect. Um, and most of the time, these are regulated by negative feedback systems. Sometimes they're regulated by like dual negative feedback systems, where the end result of, of pathway one inhibits the result of pathway two and vice versa. Um, and so a, lo a lot of that is going to be regulated by the hypothalamus. So let's talk about the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is connected to the pituitary gland by the infundibulum. So the hypothalamus is a little bit out of view here. We have the posterior pituitary and the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary creates and secretes hormones. The posterior pituitary just collects and secretes hormones that are created by the, um, by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is the major link between the nervous and endocrine systems. It's what helps keep everything in homeostasis. And it's going to regulate almost all aspects of growth, development, metabolism, etc. And this is just kind of showing you the vasculature and the, the hypophysial portal system. So again, this is the infundibulum, which connects the hypothalamus to the posterior and anterior pituitary system. Um, and this is a series of blood supply, basically, that is just a pathway of delivering 
different hormones. Generally, these hormones are either releasing or inhibiting hormones. So when we see IH or RH in front of the hormone that's inhibiting or releasing, that's going to either increase or decrease the amount of another hormone. Um, and usually that's going to be released um, through, again, these hypophysial portal systems. Here's an example of a pathway, um, and it's going to be regulated by a negative feedback loop. So here we have corticotropin releasing hormone, or CRH. Generally, the RH or the IH hormones are going to be secreted by the hypothalamus, again, through the infundibulum. The CRH is going to release, cause the release of corticotropin. So corticotropin releasing hormone causes the release of corticotropin. That makes sense. Um, corticotropin is ACTH. And when ACTH is released, that's going to stimulate the adrenal cortex cells. Remember previously we saw the adrenal medulla when we talked about chromaffin cells. Now we're talking about the adrenal cortex cells. That's going to cause the secretion of cortisol by the adrenal cortex. And then cortisol is actually going to be an inhibitor of its own pathway. So when we have high levels of cortisol, that's going to inhibit the release of CRH and also inhibit the release of corticotrophin both of which are then going to lead to lower levels, right? Corticotropin is going to lead to lower levels of cortisol. And in this way, the end result of the pathway is actually the negative inhibitor of the beginning pathway. And we see that a lot. And it's going to allow for tight regulation because as soon as it goes too high, it turns it off. And as soon as it goes too low, it turns it back on. Here's another example of one of those pathways. And this is basically showing the pathways whereby low blood glucose induces the pathway in green. And then if we end up at the very end of the pathway in green, hopefully we end up with higher levels of glucose. If we end up with too high levels of glucose, that's hyperglycemia. It's going to stimulate the pathway in red. So I'll walk you through that. But this is a way by which we are tightly regulating the concentration of a particular factor, in this case, blood glucose. So if we have low blood glucose, that's going to stimulate the release of growth hormone releasing hormone, which as you might imagine, stimulates the release of human growth hormone. When we have human growth hormone, we also are going to have increased insulin growth factor, which is going to help increase the amount of glucose because you have glycogen in the liver broken down into glucose. That means that our blood glucose levels are going to increase, hopefully rising to normal, perhaps rising too high. So if we end up with hyperglycemia, that's going to end up inhibiting the release of growth hormone releasing hormone by stimulating the release of growth hormone inhibiting hormone. So GHRH and GHIH do the exact opposite of each other. As you might imagine, growth hormone inhibiting hormone inhibits the release of growth hormone, which lowers the level of human growth hormone in IGF, which lowers the rates of glycogen breakdown, which lowers the amount of blood glucose. Blood glucose starts to fall. Once it falls too far, then we go back to lather, rinse, repeat at step one. Right? So in this way, we are tightly regulating the concentration of blood glucose by way of inhibiting and releasing hormones that stimulate the inhibition or the release of other hormones. Okay, we see this a lot. We'll see this when we talk about the reproduction, when we talk about FSH and luteinizing hormone. We'll get to that when we get to the reproductive lectures. Um, also with prolactin, but a lot of times we see these where the regulatory hormones are actually, the downstream effectors are actually the regulatory upstream molecules. Um, okay, so the pituitary gland has two main regions, the anterior and the posterior. The posterior pituitary gland does not synthesize any hormones. It does store and release two hormones, namely those two hormones are oxytocin and ADH. As you may remember, it's the love hormone and ADH is involved in fluid retention or anti-diuretic, right? So trying to keep as much water in as possible. Um, this here is showing you, again, here's the infundibulum and we talked about the hypothalamohypophysial tract, that's here. So we have neurosecretory cells in the hypothalamus which are going to secrete molecules out through these axon terminals into the posterior pituitary where it's just basically going to be held onto oxytocin and ADH until they're told to release them. The anterior pituitary, however, is going to be responsible for seven major hormones, and we'll talk about those in just a bit. Um, but first, let's talk about the ADH pathway. Again, ADH pathway or AD antidiuretic hormone pathway is going to be a pathway of water resorption. It's going to act on three major things, including the kidneys, the sweat glands, and the, or the arterioles. And it does that um, by another one of these feedback loops that we talked about previously. So if we have high blood osmotic pressure, 
that's going to say that we have, um, we're starting to get a little bit dehydrated, right? It means our blood's a little bit thicker than it should be. We need a little bit more water in it. That's detected by osmoreceptors. So just like anything in the body, we have particular receptors that partic detect particular conditions. In this case, it's the osmotic pressure of the blood. Once these osmoreceptors detect that high blood osmotic pressure, they're going to tell the neurosecretory cells to synthesize and release ADH. So antidiuretic hormone is going to get liberated um, in the posterior pituitary into the bloodstream where it has three major target tissues. Again, the kidneys responsible for water retention, um, the sweat glands, so decreasing water loss by perspiration, and constricting our arterioles, which can increase blood pressure to make sure that we have appropriate blood flow if, for example, we're having something like hemorrhage, which is causing this. Um, Again, the opposite pathway would be if we had low blood osmotic pressure. If we have low blood, os blood osmotic pressure, that's going to inhibit these hypothalamic osmoreceptors, which is going to reduce the secretion of antidiuretic hormone, which means that we are not going to be retaining more water, and we're going to be normal sweating, and we'll have relaxation of our arterioles. Um, okay, so here's the thyroid gland. Here's the right and the left lateral lobe. Sometimes there's also an isthmus or like a pyramidal lobe. Um, that looks kind of like this. Here's the pyramidal lobe. Here's the left lateral lobe, right lateral lobe. Again, it's going to be found underneath the larynx and above the trachea. Inside the thyroid, we have follicles. Those follicles are going to be responsible for the creation of thyroid molecules, T3 and T4. Um, we also are going to have follicular cells that surround the follicle and parafollicular cells that are going to be just outside of that follicle sitting as a support network. Um, let's see, that all happens by a pretty complex pathway, which I told you I wouldn't quiz you on details of, but I do kind of need you to know the overview of. Basically, the first step is that we trap iodide, and, oh, okay, so this is going into the follicular cells, right, and then this will be into that lumen. Here we have the iodide trapped at the same time the follicular cells are going to be secreting via the Golgi apparatus and secretory vesicles, something called TGB. TGB and that trapped iodide are going to cause a the um, iodinization of a tyrosine molecule on this particular precursor molecule. That then is going to be T1 and T2. They're going to get coupled and then reintegrated into this cell by way of called penocytosis or digestion. So we're going to have vesicular transport, vesicular release, vesicular reuptake. And then it's going to get taken up by the lysosomes and then secreted into the blood plasma as T3 and T4. Again, I'm not going to quiz you on the specifics of that. Just be aware that that is what the region in here inside the follicle, this TGB colloid region, is where all of the processing happens. That's all of this. And these are the cells that surround that outer part. If you were to call this like a hose, this would be the cells that surround the hose or the follicular cells. And inside this colloid region is where we are creating or converting all of the steps to be able to create T3 and T4. Um, okay, so let's talk about T3 and T4. So if we have low levels of T3 and T4, again, that's going to happen in the hypothalamus. It's going to cause the release of thyroid-releasing hormone. Thyroid-releasing hormone stimulates thyroid-stimulating hormone. Thyroid-stimulating hormone is going to stimulate the thyroid follicular cells. From these follicular cells are going to be responsible for releasing things into the follicle to help increase the amount of T3 and T4. So hopefully once we stimulate this follicle, now we're going to have more T3 and T4 released. And in this case, T3 and T4 are going to be the inhibitors of the upstream parts of the pathway. So they're going to inhibit the hypothalamus and TSH, which is then going to keep this in tight regulatory control. Um, calcitonin is also going to be something that we are going to be secreting here. Um, that's going to be involved in inhibiting osteoclast activity. And it's going to help lower the blood level of calcium. We'll talk about that in a minute. I think it gets its own pathway. Um, we also have parathyroid glands. Parathyroid glands are found outside of the thyroid glands. So here's the thyroid glands, and there's the parathyroid. We have the superior and inferior right and left. And they have chief cells and oxyphil cells. And they're not exactly sure what the oxyphil cells do, although they do know that they're going to create more parathyroid hormone in cancerous tissue than in normal tissue. And we do know the principal cells produce parathyroid, um, parathyroid hormone, or PTH. All right, so now let's look at calcitonin secretion and control. All right, so calcitonin, as you might imagine, is involved in regulation of blood calcium levels. And just like anything else, this is under tight regulation. So if we have too much, we need to have less. If we have too much, 
um, little, we need to have more. So let's start in this situation where we have too much. This is high levels of calcium in the blood. And that is obviously, that not as obviously, it's going to go this direction. So one goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to four, okay? So if we have high levels of calcium in the blood, that's going to stimulate the release of more calcitonin. Increase of calcitonin inhibits our osteoclast, which decreases our blood calcium level. Remember, we have osteoclasts and osteoblasts. This is our, our, I would call it like our bone banking system for calcium levels. Some of them are going to deposit calcium and some of them are going to um, withdraw calcium. And so calcitonin is going to inhibit the osteoclasts, which is going to result in a decreased blood calcium level. Low levels of calcium in the blood is going to stimulate the release of parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone does a couple of things. So one, it's going to stimulate the thyroid gland to make more calcitonin, but it's also going to stimulate the kidneys to make something called calcitriol. So we're going to be absorbing calcium from food as well, so from our digestive system as well as getting it from our bones. All right, we also have adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are found just on top of the kidneys, adrenal or just above the renal. Um, and they have an outer cortex and an inner medulla. They're not the only organ that has that. The kidneys themselves also have a cortex and a medulla. Um, you'll also see that in the, um, in the testes. So there's a lot of different organs. Cortex just means outside. Medulla means inside. Again, the adrenal glands are going to sit on top of the kidneys. Um, here's the adrenal cortex, here's the adrenal medulla. When we talked about the chromaffin cells, we were talking about adrenal medulla, but now we're going to be talking about the adrenal cortex, which is divided into three major zones that secrete different hormones. We have the zona glomerulosa, which is this top part, zona fasciculata, and the zona reticularis. The reticularis secretes androgens, fasciculata secretes glucocorticoids, including cortisol, glomerulosa secretes mineralocorticoids like aldosterone. Uh, all right. And then this is talking about the renin angiotensin pathway, which talks about water conservation. Um, we will get into this a lot more when we actually talk about the urination pathway, or urin urin nah, urinary system. But basically, this is a way by which we are able to control the water in our system as much as possible. So if we have the symptoms of here are going to be dehydration, which can happen if we have low amounts of water in our system, right? Also, if we have a sodium deficiency, this can lead to this, or hemorrhage, which means severe blood loss. Any of those would lead to a decrease in blood volume. A decrease in blood volume is associated with a decrease in blood pressure, which would be detected in the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidneys, which would result in increased renin. Renin, it also, that would also lead to increased angiotensin production. Angiotensinogen, which is a precursor. Anytime you see inogen, it's a precursor molecule. So angiotensinogen is a precursor for angiotensin. When angiotensinogen and renin come together, we end up getting increased angiotensin 1 that circulates in the lungs through a specialty enzyme called ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme to make angiotensin 2. Um, I will get to that question in a minute. I did see it pop up. Um, but I'm on a roll right now. So once we have angiotensin 2, that's going to go two different places, to the adrenal cortex and then also on a global scale to the arterioles for vasoconstriction. But vasoconstriction is going to help increase our blood pressure, and the adrenal cortex are going to release aldosterone, and that, that combined with sodium and water resorption is hopefully going to lead to an increase in blood volume. So both of these are going to lead to restoration of blood pressure. All right, I'm going to get back to my question. That's absolutely the correct. So the adrenal cortex um, is going to secrete the hormones that are involved in what we were just talking about, all of this water resorption, etc. But when we were talking about the autonomic nervous system, we were talking about specifically the sympathetic pathway and how it could release... Um, acetylcholine into the chromaffin cells in the adrenal medulla and that would cause a global release of acetyl I'm sorry of norepinephrine and that would be released into the blood supply so um, we were talking about this particular organ or gland in two different sections of this talk both in the autonomic nervous system for the chromaffin cells and also in the uh, for the cortex for the endocrine system okay very good question I hope I clarified that well enough. Um, okay, so...
Again, the adrenal medulla, as we were just talking about, consists of these hormone-producing cells. These are the cr chromaffin cells, right? Um, and these chromaffin cells are going to also be responsive to epinephrine and norepinephrine. That's going to be responsible to the sympathetic responses. Um, so in, the, in regards to the endocrine system, the adrenal medulla is still involved. It does have cells that produce hormones, right? Um, but oftentimes these cells are going to not oftentimes, they are under control of the sympathetic system of the autonomic nervous system. So remember, the nervous system and the endocrine system work hand in hand in terms of regulation. Um, and norepinephrine can be released under stress from the autonomic nervous system, as I mentioned, and they also help the body resist stress. All right, so let's move on to the pancreas unless we have any questions on the adrenal glands. Nope, okay, moving on. So here's the pancreas right here. It's situated right next to um, the intestines. And that's because it's involved in secretion of digestive enzymes. It's also situated right next to the spleen here. Um, so just to kind of orient you, here's the abdominal aorta. So this is the large uh, aortic trunk that's going to run down towards the back, like right in front of the spine. It has major trunks, which are going to branch off, like the celiac trunk, etc. cetera. Um, we also have the splenic artery, which branches off the hepatic artery. These are all going to be regions where we will see nerve plexus when we talked about the autonomic nervous system and how they're named. And again, they're all named based on the organs in which they service. Um, but I digress. So the pancreas has a tail and a body and a head. Um, the head is going to be directly in alignment with the duodenum of the small intestines. And the head and the tail are serviced by different arteries. So the tail is serviced by the splenic artery, um, and the head is going to be serviced here by the gastroduodenal artery. If we look at it histologically, we have little islets of Langerhans, which look kind of like this. And if we look inside of those, there's different cell types inside them, including alpha cells, beta cells, delta cells, and F cells. And yes, you are going to be responsible. There's a table in the PowerPoint. Um, you are responsible for which of these secrete which hormones and how those hormones interact. Um, mostly, we're going to be relative to like blood glucose levels, but also secretion of insulin and glucagon. All of this has to do with regulating blood glucose levels or in the pathway with regulating bl blood glucose levels. And then also the regulation of digestive enzymes. So all of this has to do with digestion. So um, just to kind of give you an overview, alpha cells secrete glucagon. Glucon glucagon increases blood glucose levels. Beta cells secrete insulin. Insulin decreases blood glucose levels, so alpha and beta kind of work antagonistically. Delta cells secrete growth hormone, inhibiting hormone, GHIH, um, and that's going to inhibit the secretion of insulin and glucagon. And F cells are going to secrete pancreatic polypeptide, which regulates the release of different pancreatic digestive enzymes. So am I going to give you this image and ask you to be able to tell me the difference between what an alpha cell and a beta cell and a delta cell look like? No. But are you going to have to know what they secrete and how they're involved in the different digestive processes? Um, yeah. Um, so this show talks about regulation of insulin secretion and glucagon via these negative feedback mechanisms. And so this is basically another one of those where we, whereby we have, um, we actually kind of have two separate pathways that are working simultaneously. So if we have low blood glucose, again that's hypoglycemia, the alpha cells are going to secrete glucagon. Glucagon works to do two main things, works in the liver to both convert glycogen into glucose and also create new glucose from lactic acid and certain amino acids. So, um, so this is called glycogenolysis, breaking down glycogen into glucose, and this is called gluconeogenesis, or the creation of new glucose from other biomolecules like lactic acid. Either way, that's going to serve to increase the amount of glucose that's secreted by the liver cells, which is going to increase the amount of blood glucose levels. Sometimes they might fall or rise too high, which causes hyperglycemia. If we have too high levels, it's going to inhibit the release of glucagon, and then also, so inhibit this pathway, and then stimulate the beta cells to secrete insulin. So we're going to downregulate that pathway and upregulate this one, and then vice versa. Then this way we're going to help keep this really tightly in check in terms of our blood glucose levels. So again, if we have high levels of insulin or increase of insulin, insulin's going to help diffuse the glucose into cells, so by the, it's going to increase the uptake of glucose. Also going to convert glucose into glycogen very quickly. Um, and increase the uptake of amino acids and protein synthesis, which uses energy, 
And then also speed the synthesis of fatty acids, again, consuming the energy, which would help break down and you know, convert the glucose. That's going to help um, or move the glucose out of the bloodstream if it moves it into the cell. That's going to cause the blood glucose levels to fall until we end up getting hypoglycemia, which inhibits the release of insulin and upregulates, you guessed it, glucagon. So in this way, we have a tight homeostatic regulation by these negative feedback loops. Okay, um, so we also talked about the pineal gland and the thymus. Here's the pineal gland, which is found in the, in the brain. And um, so the thymus is going to secrete things involved in immunity. So when we talk about the immune system, we'll spend a lot of time about the thymus, uh, talking about the thymus. Um, basically, that's where we get T cells, which you've heard of immune response. We'll talk about T cells and B cells. Um, and the T cells come from the thymus. And we also are going to have some other um, hormones like thymosin, thymohumeral factor, um, thymic factor, and thymopoietin. Poietin just means creation of, so creation of um, thymosin most likely. It's going to promote maturation of those T cells. Again, that's involved in our immune response. Okay, um, and last but not least, we talked about our stress response, how we have different um, pathways involved in our stress response. So if we have high levels of stress, that's going to stimulate nervous impulses in both the sympathetic pathways, so the sympathetic centers in the spinal cord, which then again leads to release of um, epinephrine and norepinephrine by the chromaffin cells, the adrenal medulla, which is going to have a global effect stimulating our fight or flight responses. This is a list of all the stress responses, including what happens to your heart rate and increased beat as well, um, so increased force and const of your constriction. Uh, or contraction, I apologize. Also, it, it leads to constriction of your blood vessels, dilation of blood vessels in other areas. So constriction of blood vessels in your viscera and your skin, dilation of blood vessels in your heart, lungs, brain, and skeletal muscles. Um, contraction of the spleen, which actually if you squeeze the spleen a little bit, you can release blood. So it's going to cause blood to end up going back into, so increase your blood volume. Also converting glycogen into glucose. So glycogenolysis, that happens in the liver, sweating, dilation of airways, uh, and water retention as well. It's also going to decrease your digestive activity. Again, that's because we're doing fight or flight, and rest and digest is on the opposite side. Um, additionally, we have other hormones that are going to be released here from the hypothalamus, like corticotropin-releasing hormone, growth hormone-releasing hormone, right? Thyrotropin-releasing hormone. Thyrotropin-releasing hormone leads to TSH. GHRH leads to human growth hormone. Corticotrophin-releasing hormone leads to adrenocorticotrophic hormone. Um, all of these have different pathways that they act on. So TSH acts on the thyroid to increase the amount of thyroid hormones 3 and 4, which is going to help use your glucose more efficiently to help produce more ATP. Um, we also, I guess not more efficiently, just increase the use of glucose. Um, human growth hormone is going to go into the liver and help increase the IGFs or insulin-like growth factors, which are going to help with lipolysis and glycogenolysis the breakdown of lipids and glycogen to help increase your blood glucose levels. And ACTH lacks, acts on the adrenal cortex to increase cortisol, which is responsible for things like lipolysis, gluconeogenesis, um, breaking down and building up of proteins, um, and sensitization of your blood vessels and reduction of inflammation. So all of these um, are stress responsors that occur in high stress situations. Okay, and again, they're all going to be involved in the fight or flight response. Let's see. Until we end up reaching exhaustion, which eventually happens when we deplete all of our supplies and all of a sudden we're just not able to respond to the stress. Okay, so that is going to bring us to the end of our talk here. Do we have any questions? Excuse me, do you have any questions on anything? I know that's a lot to take in, and it's an 80-page document, but I think it's, it would be easier, at least for me, to have everything in one page or in one document than having to bounce all over the place. All right, so I'm going to pop this chat back open in case anybody has any questions on anything. And in the meanwhile, I'm going to go ahead and end our video footage here. So thank you guys for joining us. I will be uploading this very shortly.